Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're just going to get underway. I want to start on time because I understand that uh, we also have to end on time because we're going to be kicked out of the room. So we want to make sure you get to hear the most from our fantastic panellists assembled today and also that we have time for uh, questions and answers and comments um, from, from you as well. Welcome to Why It Matters, AI for Older Persons. Uh, my name is Ursula Weinhoven. I'm the representative for the International Telecommunication Union here at the UN in New York. The ITU is the UN's specialized agency for information and communication technologies. And we're absolutely thrilled to be a co-host of this session today, this very important session, with UNDESA, the permanent mission of Japan's United Nations, and AARP. Uh, and I would like to give a special shout out actually um, to Amina Lamrabat of UNDESA for putting this session together and for his championship generally of digital inclusion. So frontier and emerging technologies like artificial intelligence do hold enormous potential for the sustainable development goals and for the service of older persons. Many of you here may know of the conference, AI for Good, which actually will take place for the third time next month in Geneva from May 28 to 31. And it underscores the great potential of AI for Good across the entirety of the SDGs. And reinforcing this is the fact that more than 30 UN agencies are partnering on the event. There are also, as we know and we'll hear about as well in this session, risks to be addressed in order to maximise the positive impacts and address the potential negative consequences that AI, including in combination with other technologies, can have from risks of widening inequality, job disruption, misuse of data and replicating bias among some of them. A couple of weeks ago in Geneva at the World Summit for the Information Society, ITU partnered with CSEND and AARP on a session called Older Persons and New Technologies, a smart mix. The outcomes of that session may be a good jumping off point for this session today. And it emphasized a few things. Um, first of all, the importance of affordable quality access to the internet for older persons, wherever they live in order to bridge digital divides. Half of the world is still not yet connected to the internet, and older persons are disproportionately impacted. It's important, of course, to remember that older persons are not a homogenous group. For example, um, younger, higher income, and more highly educated older persons actually may use the internet and broadband at rates similar, in some cases even greater, than the general population. Relatedly, the importance of digital skills and lifelong learning opportunities for older persons to facilitate full participation and continual adaptation in the digital age. The need also, and this is an important one, to dispel myths and stereotypes about older persons and new technologies that risk excluding them from opportunities for employment, investment for their tech businesses, and also recognize older persons' agency as both consumers, but also as creators of ICTs. And I'm reminded here of a quote from Melinda Gates, who has said, not every great idea comes wrapped in a hoodie. So it's good to remember that. <laughs> There's also, of course, huge potential for ICTs to have positive impact on older persons' lives. But that development of ICTs for older persons must be done with their participation to ensure that it meets their needs and that it's accessible to those with varying levels of functional limitations. Also that mastering information communication technologies allows older pe persons to be more resilient when facing hardships and isolation and to seize opportunities to contribute to society. That ICT also provides opportunities for older persons to continue to learn and to share their many years of accumulated tacit knowledge and insights that innovative ICT solutions require investment from and collaboration with a variety of organisations in order to be successful in the longer term. That ICT is also useful for caregivers providing care and enhancing safety to older persons living with a variety of conditions. And, and lastly, an outcome from this WISIS forum session was that ICT can also give older persons more opportunities to co-manage their living space 
uh, supporting independent living and greater autonomy. So with, with that, without further ado, it is my pleasure to invite His Excellency, Mr. Yasuhisa Kawamura, Ambassador, Deputy Permanent Representative of Japan to the UN to make his opening remarks. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, introduction. Uh, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, as a co-host of the event, uh, it is my great pleasure uh, to uh, deliver my welcome remarks to all of you. Uh, I wish to extend my appreciation to DESA uh, for organizing this event, and I would also like to thank the uh, distinguished panelists and uh, moderators uh, for traveling all the way uh, to New York City. As you may know, uh, Japan enjoys the highest level of longevity in the world. And our society is often called a super-aged society, where people aged 65 and over comprise of about 27% of the total population. Under such circumstances, Japan is addressing uh, the challenges of its aging population, including ensuring the social inclusion of older uh, persons and working on the uh, realization of a sustainable aging society. In February 2018, last year, uh, the Japanese cabinet endorsed the uh, general principles concerning measures for the aged society, which is a policy guideline for addressing our aging population. One of the, uh, these new principles is the idea of not uniformly defining older persons as persons aged 65 and over. Instead, the guideline envisions an ageless society uh, where people of all generations can participate in the society based on their desires and describes government's roles in various areas, such as labor and technological innovation, to achieve this end. In recent years, innovation has attracted attention as one of the solutions for the challenges of an aging population. Innovation is expected to help us overcome age constraints and dis disabilities and support people to be independent and active in society. One successful use of advanced science and technology for an aged society is the utilization of uh, information and communication technology, including AI in nursing care. For example, uh, since the rapid aging of population is causing a shortfall in human resources for nursing care in Japan, we are working on reducing the burden and workload placed on care, care staff by introducing robotic care equipment, including transfer and devices such as assist suits, night monitoring sensors, and IT for administrative work. The role of robotics are not only limited to supporting or ass assisting role in nursing care, but robotics could also take a central role in nursing care or long-term care with AI. I believe with the participants of today's distinguished panelists, including Mr. Takanori Shibata uh, of Japan, uh, the inventor of a well-known uh, seal-type robot called Paro, I think he is with the, uh, the Paros today. Uh, we'll have uh, fruitful discussions on the development and key challenges of AI uh, with a special focus on uh, senior uh, generations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And it's, I think, really inspiring as well to hear about these developments in Japan, which hopefully um, can pave the way for other countries as well, increasingly grappling with uh, these similar issues. So I'm now going to turn to Mr. Christoph Angster, Senior Policy Officer from the Federal Ministry of Labor, Social Affairs, Health and Consumer Protection in Austria to make his opening remarks. Thank you, Ursula, <clears throat> for the introduction and the invitation to open this outstanding side event. I'm truly thankful that the Division for, Social, for Inclusive Social Development of UNDESA and the Japanese Permanent Mission organized this event and managed to have this exclusive panel to speak about the role of artificial intelligence as part of a frontier technology that is already influencing our daily lives significantly. I'm sure every one of us here in this room has already heard the term AI, 
but what does it actually imply? Am I personally already using AI? And how will artificial intelligence impact social and sustainable development? Austria organized a very similar conference last November in Vienna as we had the very same questions and we wanted to get some answers about that. If these are also some of your questions, then I can assure you that this event will give you some answers as examples of as some of the panelists have also been in Vienna and I know that their presentations will be outstanding. One thing that I would like to highlight before I give back the word to Ursula is that the current technological developments are indeed part of a revolution. Almost every day, researchers and startup companies present technologies and devices that push the boundaries of the unimaginable a bit further away. At first sight, many of these inventions, like speech or facial recognition or health measures recordings, seem to be the silver bullet for many problems, especially for older persons. But with great power comes great responsibility, and it is important to take a second look and double check if the existing human rights framework is fit and entirely inclusive towards these new developments and the needs of older persons, or if it is necessary to identify and to articulate how existing rights apply to other persons using and subject to these technologies and, <clears throat> and to identify and close new gaps. This event wants to take a look at this and initiate an exchange of ideas between member states, NHRIs, the civil society, the private sector and experts from the field. I'm very much looking forward to the following presentations and would like to give back the word, the word to Ursula. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christoph. Um, also more, very important framing remarks for this uh, terrific panel that we're now going to, to turn to. Uh, I'm also pleased that it's a multi-stakeholder group. I think that's really important to hear all the different perspectives from the different kinds of organizations. So we've heard from government and now we're going to have the chance also to hear from UN, civil society, academia, and the private sector as well. So I'm going to introduce the panel first, and then we'll turn to our first uh, speaker. So first we have um, Amal Abu Rafay, Chief of Programming on Aging for UNDESA. We have Christina Fitzpatrick, Director of Policy Integration for AARP. We have Michelle Johnson, Assistant Professor of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, University of Pennsylvania. We have Roberta Massey, President, uh, Cooperativa uh, Soleil, if I've got that right. We have uh, Takanori Shibata, Chief Senior Research Scientist, National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology, um, Para Robots. Uh, and uh, some, some wonderful friends here I'm sure we're going to hear about a little later on. <laughs> we also have Mr. Anthony Nunez, president of INF uh, Robotics. So without further ado, let's turn to Amal, Chief of Programming on Aging. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ursula. Mr. Ambassador, delegates, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and and friends, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Although, I have to say at the start, I'm a little upset because there's been a change that was made to the slide that I had posted up there. You see, this is one of the many side events that have been taking throughout the past three days, including today, along the side of the General Assembly's open-ended working group on aging. And it's really been organized and put together and thought through and implemented by my colleague, Amin Lamrabat. So I actually had the Amin Lamrabat event at the 10th session there, but he removed it. <laughs> um, I also want to echo what Christoph has said. This conversation has been picking up attention and did start in Vienna. Um, and I'm thrilled that the two panel members that I had with me speaking, they're both women scientists, Michelle Johnson and also Lorna McGregor, who's here in this room, are joining us today as well. Please, if you have time after the event and have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to them. It's a real pleasure to have them here at the UN. Welcome. Um, next, please. So 
I'm going to echo the message and questions that I raised when I was in Vienna, which is really based on uh, the, one of the flagship outputs that DESA prepares, not our department, but another department, on the World Economic and Social Survey, which was launched, uh, this is the latest one they had, uh, in November 2018 and it addresses frontier technologies for sustainable development. So what I did was I looked through it and picked out the issues that are relevant to older persons and raised some human rights questions that can come up um, for us to think about in the work that we do in the main room on the rights of older persons. Next, please. So one of the areas that um, I was able to find in this flagship uh, publication is the role of robotics in healthcare and that, how that presents an opportunity for older persons. So autonomous surgical tools perform certain routine but highly technical surgical procedures which result in better outcomes for older people by reducing risks on human er in human error, uh, minimizing trauma, lowering blood loss, and reducing risk of infection, and basically shortening the length of their hospital stay. Assistive robotics, including exoskeletons, assist older persons with physical disability to reduce physical limitations, and Michelle will also address the, the role of robotics in rehabilitation as well. 3D printing, used to manufacture prosthetics and implants, and what we hear about a lot, which is robot as caregivers and care providers, and how they enable health monitoring, provide physical assistance, execute basic daily tasks, stimulate cognition for dementia patients, provide companionship, which combats loneliness, and assure security um, as alert should there be a heart failure or a fall for the older person, and that supports aging in place, which we highly encourage. Next, please. But also, robotics and healthcare raise some challenges in human rights implications. So there was a WHO project that was done that looked into um, considering in terms of the use of robotics in surgery, the implications of cost and on maintenance, and how that would affect the allocation of resources in public health systems. And also, UNESCO published a 2017 report whereby some of the questions that were raised there related to can robots provide care? Are physical and emotional aspects taken care of by machines? Does it potentially reduce interaction of older persons with other people? Is there a loss of autonomy? Is the older person permission taken before they're touched or moved or, or addressed by these machines? Is there any loss of privacy involved? What about the accountability? And it raises the need for developing guidelines and legislation in consultation with older persons and, and their preferences and their needs and listening to their voices. Next, please. Um, I also saw that the flagship report addressed uh, transportation. The, the autonomous vehicles were, were addressed there. And this is really maybe to the public one of the most visible applications of AI because it utilizes you know, the cameras, the radars, GPS, and laser. And we know that the, it is estimated that the use of these vehicles could reduce accidents rates by 90% in the U.S., potentially saving 30,000 lives and $190 billion in associated healthcare costs. Um, it's great because it shortens time travel and it, it allows more independence for older people and therefore a better quality of life, especially for those that are um, dependent on others for transportation. But issues of um, unpredictable consequences and liability, there's still a question mark on, on how that's gonna work. Next, please. The flagship report also addresses automation and the future of work of older persons. So a debate persists on the extent to which jobs could be uh, uh, automated and replaced by machines. Many technological, economic, and social factors determine the extent and the pace of automation, like education levels and size of the manufacturing sector and the level of government commitment and spending on this and the strength of financial laws. And there was a 2000 study, study uh, Mercer study, that examined the risk of automation and what it posed to older workers around the world and measured the extent to which older workers are employed in low skill work. And what caught my attention was that China 
the average risk of automation to older person, older workers is 76%. And in Germany, the average risk of automation to older workers is 57%. Despite high concentrations of advanced skill work, older workers, surprisingly, are still susceptible to automation. Automation can affect countries that employ a significant number of economically active older people in the agriculture sector. The share of jobs at risk of being lost is above 50% for Angola, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Ethiopia, India, Nigeria, the Philippines, and Vietnam. Next, please. So the message here is that policymakers need to minimize the adverse uh, impact of automation. And here's where the human rights angle comes in. The legal guarantees, uh, issues related to availability, accessibility, adequacy, and non-discrimination. Next, please. So what are the key takeaways from this flagship output as far as uh, artificial intelligence is concerned and older persons? So manifestations of a great technological and developmental divide persists between developed and low-income developing countries. Closing development gaps is not only an imperative under Agenda 2030, but also a prerequisite for many developing countries to exploit the promises for many frontier technologies and bridge the technological divide that limits their growth and potentials. Lack of access to basic things like electricity and inadequate health and sanitation facilities, underdeveloped physical and digital infrastructures prevent the possibility of leapfrogging and taking full advantage of frontier technologies. Next, please. Frontier technologies hold immense potential to improve people's lives, to foster growth, prosperity, and environmental sustainability, and to significantly accelerate efforts to achieve the uh, 2030 Agenda and its Sustainable Development Goals. Frontier technologies are interdependent as advances in one is likely to impact others and in they're interconnected through their generation of and need for large data sets. And the flagship output also concludes that advances in frontier technologies also present new and unique challenges. Without appropriate policies, they can present risks of growing unemployment, drive greater inequality, and raise new ethical and human rights challenges. It is important that the debates focus on ethical norms and regulatory ar architecture be shaped not only by the leading technology companies, but by public debate and governments as well. And policymakers have a significant and proactive role to play in developing the legal and ethical frameworks needed to govern the evolution and the use of digital technologies. I thank you. Thank you so much, Amal. I think that was a great comprehensive introduction as well to a lot of the issues that are at stake here. Uh, Christina, let's turn to you. Christina, again, is Director of Policy Integration for AAAIP. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really glad to be here and want to thank Amin and you and Dessa for inviting me here. It's a real privilege to address you today and share with you some of the work that AARP is doing on artificial intelligence. So as many of you may know, AARP is a non-governmental organization that was founded 60 years ago to empower people to choose how they live as they age. And we accomplished that work in three important ways. One is influencing the marketplace to encourage the private sector to create products and services that um, serve the needs of older people. We educate people, giving them information so that they can live their best lives. And we advocate for government policies that both encourage innovation and protect consumers. Today I'm going to walk you through a few of the different ways that ARP is currently um, trying to advance artificial intelligence and its ability to, um, to help older people and also share with you some of the challenges that we see that um, need to be addressed. A big concern for AARP, and I think for all of us, is social isolation. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, this is different than loneliness. This is a lack of meaningful contact with other people. And we know from research that social isolation has dramatic negative consequences for people's health. One study 
demonstrated that it has the same negative health outcomes or as negative health outcomes as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And older people are more likely than others to experience social isolation. They may no longer be working. They're more likely than others to experience the loss of a loved one, the death of a loved one. And they're more likely than others to have mobility issues that may limit their ability to get out and about. ARP has established combating social isolation as a major issue. And one strategy that we're using is partnering with, um, with technology companies and with affordable housing communities to use voice-activated technology to see if it can um, help to reduce social isolation. So we have, we're working in four different low-income housing communities now, giving the residents these voice-activated technologies that you may recognize. And uh, so we're giving them to the residents so they can use them the way anybody else uses them, to ask for about the temperature outside, or my favorite, which is to ask Alexa to tell me a joke. Um, but the, we also work with the coordinators at these senior living facilities and have developed skills for Alexa so that um, they can push out information about activities going on in the community so that the residents can ask, um, are there any activities today and can find about, about movies or lectures or games or, or whatever is going on. They can establish reminders and the hope is that if they know about these events and that they're reminded about these events, they're more likely to go out and, and interact with others. And we're also finding that teaching the residents to help other people with that technology, that promotes social interaction. Having this common experience of trying to use this technology is a source of bonding for these residents. And most importantly, ARP is engaging in a formal evaluation of this pilot project to see if it really does reduce social isolation. Another high priority for AARP is enabling independent living. We want people to be able to age in place in their homes or in the community for as long as they want to. It's increasingly important because people are living longer on average. 50% of 10-year-olds in the United States can expect to live until age 100. And so that has definite implications for um, living independently well into, um, well into older age. Because people want to live at home, but they also worry. They worry about um, being able to manage their complex medical conditions. They worry about falling. And technology powered by, um, by AI can help. ARP is collaborating with the health technology company to, um, to produce this contraption, I think it's very cute, called Pillow, that helps people to manage their diseases. It uses voice-first technology, facial recognition technology, and other applications of artificial intelligence to make sure that people are getting the medication they need when they need it, that they can interact by video with caregivers and family members, and it can be set up so there, that there are alerts. If somebody misses doses of medication, somebody else knows and can check in on the person. Another uh, important element of people living on their own is being able to travel when they are no longer safely, they're no longer safely able to drive themselves. There is a long way to go before this is a reality that um, regular people can take advantage of, um, but we need to start working now to make sure that the technology is developed in a way that meets the needs of older people. As one example of that, People with mobility impairments need to be able to use these cars. And people in wheelchairs provide one example, that if the cars aren't designed r right now in a way that can accommodate a wheelchair, it's very difficult to retrofit them at the back end. And so we want to work with technology companies to ensure that. I want to talk about, we've, we've talked about and heard about today already a lot of the promising features of artificial intelligence and all that it can do. But there are some important trade-offs and challenges that we need to acknowledge and address. So for example, the same technology that allows for powerful analytics that help to promote important um, breakthroughs in medical research 
those, can, those kind of analytics can be used by insurance companies, by employers, in a way that results in discrimination against older workers and others. However inadvertent that, will, that may be, it's still, that can, there can still be a discriminatory result. It's also the case that autonomous decision making, so these decisions that are made by algorithms, uh, they raise questions about liability and accountability. And self-driving cars provide an easy example of that, where if there is no driver and there is an accident, who is responsible? Is there many, many different um, partners working in that context? So how do we establish that? So I think it's very really true that we are at an important moment here where we can take steps that will improve um, how artificial intelligence interacts with people and helps people age. I think we're at a place um, that we were a century ago when cars were introduced onto the roads. And there was a lot of accidents, a lot of dangerous interactions between cars and pedestrians, cars and um, horse and uh, carriages, before finally rules of the road were developed that everybody um, uh, knew about and adhered to. And we're at that place now where we need to figure out what the rules of the road are so that we both enable the innovation and the promise, but also pr protect um, against the downsides. And I want to close by reminding us all that the fundamental requirement for people to take advantage of all this artificial intelligence is having access to broadband technology. And this is a map of the U.S. The blue shows counties that have access to broadband technology. The yellow shows counties that do not. And it's a you can see there's a disturbing amount of area in this country where people don't have access to broadband even if they can afford it. Um, and that's all. So thank you very much again for having me and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Christina, and really exciting to see some of those applications as well and what we can uh, look forward to as well, of course, as some of the, the challenges that we need to be mindful of. So now we're going to turn to Michelle Johnson, um, and as a reminder, she's Assistant Professor of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation for the University of Pennsylvania. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Oops, is it on? Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to present a perspective of thinking about how rehabilitation robots can be harnessed, how they harness artificial intelligence, and thinking about it for the 21st century elder uh, person. So as we heard that um, the 21st um, century older person is quite diverse. Today we have about 700 million people representing about 10% of the world population. By 2050, they're arguing that this number will be 20% of the world population. I want to drive home the, the point that was already made that older persons, are, they're not a homogeneous group. They're active elders, frail elders, and disabled elders. And my goal is to support all types of elders. One of the things that we recognize is that they're all living within community and that the people that we want to take care of this population are essentially there is a shortage. We acknowledge that. We acknowledge that there is a gap. And we're basically acknowledging that technology can help bridge this gap. That's kind of why we're here in this room. Um, one of the three things I want us to consider is thinking about that technology needs to be adaptable, affordable, and have different levels of autonomy. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Adaptability, when I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking about robots and technology must adapt to the changing needs of the older population. And then I do think that artificial intelligence will allow robots to be able to adapt even better because essentially things are really complex in this space and a lot of the problems are quite complex. And so having kind of deep learning, machine learning, and these types of issue or um, algorithms might be able to help us do better. One of the things to recognize is that as older, as we age, there are increasing presence of disability in the population. Um, just the graph shows the increasing 15.8% is expected to have ambulatory issues, cognitive issues, 5.4%, independent living issues, etc. And so we need to think about elder persons and being able to support them with our technology on these in, in different ways. One of the things that my lab is doing is thinking about how do we use robots to help act elders that are on that cusp of being active and frail 
kind of stay active and stay um, engaged. So we think about developing different types of gaming technology for that. We also think about, well, what happens if an elder becomes, um, has a stroke? How do we support that elder with technology and with our control algorithms? So how do we develop robots can support recovery of drinking activities, et cetera? Then we also try to think about well, in the future, if we need to co-collaborate with robots, how do we get them to be sentient? How do we get them to understand when someone's having difficulty and how do we then come in and help? We also want to, um, so in pulling back and kind of recognizing this, um, this group of elders, recognizing that there's economic issues here, and if we want um, technology to be uh, fully accessible, we might want to think about the fact that there is an issue with income. <laughs> so as you get old, many elders might kind of uh, experience a decrease in their income and as also going to a fixed income. So affordability is an issue. But affordability should be also thought about in the context of where elders are living. They're living in diverse um, populations, in diverse countries, uh, high and low and middle income, uh, in their homes, um, in assisted living facilities, in the community, in urban versus rural environments. And where is care occurring? A care is occurring in all these different places. And so by nature, we often assume that care for when you think of rehab, is happening in the hospital, but now we are seeing a diversity of care. It's happening in a variety of places where there might be resource constraints, space constraints, et cetera. So we need to think about that when we're, when we're developing um, robots. One of the things I want to stress is that robots must be affordable and be considered um, in being able to be used in settings where um, not typical, when we think about hospital, and in terms of being able to be used in the home, and we should also consider cost versus benefit, that they should provide affordable and preventive care, and we need to be able to extend them outside of the hospital environment. We need to be able to enable them to stress resources. Basically, the fact that the number of caregivers are decreasing, they need to be able to, to, to be efficient in allowing a small group of caregivers to serve a larger group of um, elders. Then also I think the challenge from an engineering point of view is being able to provide high-tech features at affordable costs. Not a trivial idea. So one of the things in a lab we're working on is thinking through, well, do the robots have to be super complex in order for them to be effective? Here's a one degree of freedom system robot that we're working for stroke survivors and thinking about enabling them and coupling them with games and different types of activities and assessment to be able to create an environment that would also allow us to provide therapy but at a much lower cost. One of our work in collaboration with Mexico is thinking through having one therapist oversee multiple patients as they do therapy. And so in this particular system is thinking through robot um, robots positioned on a gym type environment where they can do, uh, four patients can work together in order to do therapy. We also have been experimenting with thinking through how do we create low cost affordable service robots for elders that go to daycare. Um, so they're basically living at home, but they're going to a community center for care. And so we've been working with a lot, and we've been talking to clinicians, their caregivers, and the elders in themselves to identify what type of activity should these robots be doing, and then what should these robots be looking like. If we look at this chart, we notice that elders are asking for you know robots that can help them accomplish different tasks. The clinicians are asking for robots that can do safety and health care checks, um, personal connected living, that's a big thing, coming from the social isolation. The elders are asking for meaningful contact with this ro these robots, and also for cognitive kind of support. We had a list, and we published this, a list of um, t prioritized tasks that the elders were asking for. And you can see anywhere from supporting outings, we we're like, maybe we can't build a low-cost robot to do that. But <laughs> we can think about other needs as well. And so one of the things that we've been exploring is kind of how do we think about what these robots should look like if they are going to support a delivery task. It, does the elder feel comfortable 
connecting and talking to these robots and being able to interact. We're learning a lot about this with the goal of what should we settle on in terms of the form of the robot, et cetera. Maybe a colleague has kind of been developing some additional social robot, looks like the pillow robot that you've, that you've mentioned. But these are other ways that AI and robotics can come together to support elders. This is more specific in that this robot is supporting medication and chronic disease management. The last idea is about autonomy. Elder, as it's already been said, older persons desire um, independence, inclusion, and they we need to make sure that the robots are helping to prevent um, as well as being able to help them maintain autonomy. And I believe that robots and AI technology must balance this autonomy with efficiency to protect patient data, privacy, security, and their well-being. Some of the things that I talk about in the ideal humanoid robots is Elders want them to assist with their tasks. They want, we want them to monitor elder actions. We want them to provide physical and verbal feedback. I had a, a recent um, engagement with elders where we're asking, well, what is weird? <laughs> what, what type of things you don't want robots to be able to do? Um, we want to be able to think about um, robots that can modify their level of involvement so that we can preserve the patient, and et cetera. Um, for the sake of time, I won't go into these. Um, thinking about well, if the robot must be fully autonomous and it's just a robot, will the elder, here is Pepper. Pepper is a popular commercial robot that could possibly do walking activities with, um, with patients. What should that look like? Uh, here is an idea of elder doing a walking task with a patient. Um, and how, how, how does that, how do we mediate that interaction would be the question. Possible barriers to acceptance, I think um, some people have already mentioned. I think we don't want robots to replace human um, contact, but that is a risk. We also might be issues with how safe, how should the robot interact so that some people might perceive that they're not very safe, but we want to balance that and we want to encourage safety. People might say they're not good as caregivers, so why do we have them? <laughs> and that they, um, they may not be able to easily obey privacy and security rules. One clinician said to me, well, what if the robot blurts out in the middle of the elevator, your blood pressure is high? <laughs> and I said, okay, well, we'll deal with that. But those are issues that actually come up when we think of um, dealing with autonomous robots. What is the solution? As a scientist, I'm still trying to figure this out. One of the things that we believe is that through participatory um, design, that's how we're going to um, be able to develop robots that balance this issue of the, the negative with the positive to create robots that can really function in the community environment. And I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michelle. That's some really important and exciting research there. Um, thank you for sharing that. And now we're going to turn to um, Roberta Massey, president of Cooperativa Sole. And I believe she's also going to um, be assisted by Filippo Lupo. Have I got that correct? You're going to, it's a tag team, correct? I represent Cooperativa Sole. Oggi con Filippo Lupo racconteremo un percorso che abbiamo fatto insieme ad IBM e evidenzieremo i dati che abbiamo raccolto. Good afternoon everybody. Uh, thank you for your invitation and uh, above all thank you uh, for all the speakers uh, uh, today. Uh, we'd like to, to tell you a, a story, uh, a story of real uh, life, a story we can uh, uh, tell because we lived it. <coughs> this man uh, you, you see in this uh, photograph is uh, Mr. Oriano, a 80, 85 uh, uh, years boy that uh, represents uh, a, a real example of what uh, uh, nowadays happens. I don't know if uh, unfortunately or fortunately. So uh, Mr. Oriano uh, is uh, a self-sufficient man, but uh, is obliged 
uh, to live in a, a nursing uh, home. So uh, this is the condition of uh, uh, a lot of people in, uh, in our society uh, nowadays. He lives uh, in, um, in a nursing home that is named Oasis Serena, a peaceful oasis in, uh, in English. And uh, he lives uh, uh, with his wife uh, uh, into this uh, uh, nursing home. Uh, he is, uh, uh, as you can see, self-sufficient, uh, uh, so he helps uh, the other guests. For example, he uh, reads uh, the, the papers, the newspaper in the morning to the other guests and helps uh, them in, uh, in their activities. Oriano is uh, so the paradigmatic example of the new, the new society into which senior citizens are really the next uh, and the new generation. So Rebus Six Tantibus, all of us are called to think, to think of, uh, of a new different uh, model of welfare. The actual model of welfare is, uh, uh, is old now. Our experience, has seen the participation uh, both uh, uh, students coming from, uh, from uh, Erasmus project in, uh, in Europe and both uh, with uh, the uh, help of uh, IBM. So in this uh, photograph you can see uh, a team of work composed by members of uh, Cooperativa Sole Society, both uh, members of uh, IBM uh, group. Together with uh, uh, IBM, we have uh, decided the goals and selected the facilities to be controlled and to be uh, monitored. Here you can see Mrs. Tullia, a guest of uh, Ovesi Serena, with a jewel on his uh, uh, neck. It's not a jewel, but uh, it is a sensor for the control of the escape risk. So sensors uh, are used for the control of uh, falls, of escapes, of uh, selecting and communicating uh, data. And uh, they gave us uh, an important results under the medical point uh, of view or uh, under other point uh, of view. But uh, according to us, uh, the most important goals are the respect for the human rights. As uh, Amal uh, said before, we can't forget that uh, we uh, trust with people, with persons. So uh, we can't uh, uh, forget that uh, we uh, trust about uh, uh, freedom, about privacy, about uh, movement of, uh, of the person uh, who we care. So for us, uh, the most important uh, uh, level is the human uh, dignity, because without it, uh, uh, no progress uh, is uh, uh, available and uh, is not uh, useful. We think that uh, uh, technology is an important instrument for progress, but we believe that uh, there will be no progress without uh, the respect for human person. We have, uh, uh, in, uh, in the last years, uh, a, uh, more budget in our economies, but uh, mm, it uh, means that uh, we, we manage to, uh, to have new workers with us. We, uh, we gave uh, more opportunities for uh, young people for uh, working uh, with us. In uh, only one year, we have got uh, five uh, people more working uh, with us. The next step for us uh, is the solidarity co-housing. Uh, I agree with uh, uh, Christina when, the, when she talked about uh, so social isolation. We combat uh, against uh, social uh, isolation. So we founded a Condominio Solidale, a, a solidarity uh, co-housing named Pink Panther. 
a place of condivision into which uh, each inhabitant has a vision of living uh, in co-housing. Each one has together the others, so we combat uh, really social uh, isolation. We believe in our project. We are working hard in this direction because we think that life of each human person is not only rights, health, mind. Every woman and every man is for us a poetry. But every suffering woman and every suffering man is for us the most beautiful poetry. In that we trust. Thank you. A beautiful way to, to end that. Thank you so much, Filippo and Roberta, for that. Uh, now we're going to turn to um, Takonori Shibata and his furry friends. Um, he, as a reminder, he's the Chief Senior Research Scientist, National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology, Paro Robots. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, good, af good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and also distinguished guests. And uh, uh, I'm Takonori Shibata. And uh, today I'll talk about PARO. And uh, this is a neurological therapeutic medical robot uh, for non-pharmacological therapy. And I work for Japanese Government Research Institute, AIST. And also I'm a professor at the Tokyo Institute of Technology. And also I'm a visiting fellow at the Age Lab MIT. So uh, Dr. Joe Coughlin is a, a director and he contributed to AARP a lot. <laughs> so first I'll talk about AI and robotics for aging and health. Uh, healthcare. Then I'll explain about PARO and robot therapy. And uh, I'll briefly introduce the clinical evidence. And uh, now some uh, countries started to integrate PARO into, the, into their social system. So I'll explain them. So this is a map uh, of the <coughs> kind of world. And uh, this is from US uh, Census Bureau. And uh, it's, the map above is uh, 2015. So uh, as for the ratio of the elderly people who are more than 65 years old, uh, the higher ratio means uh, darker blue. And uh, Japan, some European countries, so they, they, they have the highest uh, blue colors. But by 2050, most countries have very dark blue colors. That means aging is not only for some small, uh, for the small number of the countries, but it, it, it's almost entire, uh, world, entire the world. And this is the population of Jap Japan. So we, have, we now have about 125 million people as population. But we are uh, like a super aging society. In 2018, uh, more than 28% of Japanese population is more than 65 years old. And we have less and less population. So we, have, uh, uh, we expect we have less caregivers for the elderly people who need care in the future. And another issue is dementia. So uh, in 2015, there were about 15 million people who are suffered from dementia. And the, nu the number will increase about uh, 75 million by 2030. And uh, the total cost of uh, medical and welfare service for elderly people with dementia, uh, it was estimated about 1 trillion US dollars in 2018. And it will become 2 trillion by 2030. And a lot of pharmaceutical companies try to develop uh, the uh, medications for Alzheimer's disease, for, for curing. But a lot of companies have already failed, and they stopped uh, develop, uh, development of the pharmaceuticals. It's not, in the last month, uh, Japanese company, the AZI and also Biogen, they announced the fail too. But the AI and the robotics uh, will contribute to this kind of situation. So there are five uh, ways to use AI or robotics. First is uh, health monitoring and checking. Second is assisting daily living. Third is assisting for detection. Fourth is companionship. The so paro is for this. And uh, anti-aging. Fifth is anti-aging. So there are many ways. And uh, in the previous uh, talks, uh, uh, there are, they already, already mentioned about them. And as for Japanese government, the, the Ambassador Kawamura introduced the Japanese project about robotics and uh, technologies. So uh, Japanese government have emphasis, emphasis in developing assisted robots uh, for assisting caregivers and also elderly people to improve their uh, uh, ability of daily living. And some uh, sensors for monitoring people. 
But here, I'm, I'd like to explain about Paro, the seal robot. So they are a kind of baby seal type robot. So I was inspired by the animal therapy. So you may know about animal therapy, but there are a lot of research on them. And there are three kinds of benefits from animal to human beings. First is psychological merit. Second is physiological merit. Third is social merit. So animals are very good for human beings. However, there are some problems of owning or using animals. <laughs> some people have allergy. Some people are afraid of bites and scratch. And there is a potential infection from animal to human beings. Uh, for the, uh, house regulation or uh, some places like hospitals, nursing homes, it's very difficult to keep or manage animal there. For such places or for such people, animal, animal type robot would be very good. So I decided to develop the baby seal robot. And the current paro is ninth generation. So I don't want to explain details, but <laughs> uh, paro has many kinds of sensors and artificial intelligence in order to have autonomous behaviors. Especially PAR has uh, learning functions. One is the uh, name, the other is behaviors. For example, at this point, I call him Paro, but if you give a new name and call it again and again, PAR gradually learns the name and start to respond to the name. Please. <laughs> uh, yeah, in Spain, in Spain, we have a different name as uh, <laughs> Nuka. <laughs> so, because uh, Paro may cause another issue <laughs> in Spanish. <laughs> Yeah, could you, could you move? Okay, yeah. You can, you can yeah, please, please move. So now PARO has been used in more than 30 countries. <clears throat> so, so far, there are more than 5,000 units, and Japan is the most. Uh, there are some cultural differences. In Japan, a lot of people bought PARO as a pet for their, for, in their life, especially uh, senior people uh, bought PARO for pet. So 50% of the users are, are like individuals. And 40% uh, are institutions. They use PARO for like, therapeutic purpose. But in Denmark, that was the first adopter in Europe. So they had a national project to evaluate PARO in dementia care. And they found PARO as very effective. And now more than 80% of local government have already adopted PARO in their dementia care. And other European countries also started to use PARO. And uh, almost 100% of the users are institutions. So they use PARO as a professional uh, therapeutic device. And in the U.S., the FDA certified PARO as a medical device in 2009. And since then, PARO has been introduced here, or here, or in the U.S. <laughs> and other countries also started to use PARO. As I said, in Japan, a lot of uh, people bought PARO as companion. So it's good for uh, prevent, preventing, uh, for keeping their healthy life. And PARO is a class two medical device here. And uh, there are a lot of clinical trials to show the uh, benefit or uh, therapeutic effects of PARO. And there are a lot of evidence. And the uh, interaction with PARO can improve quality of life of the people, anxiety, pain, depression, sleep, stress, loneliness, pressure, and engagement. <laughs> and also PARO can improve uh, communication and sociability. And uh, uh, PARO can reduce aggression, agitation, and wandering. Uh, for the people who have dementia or PTSD or brain injury. And uh, uh, that reduce the risk of falling and uh, reduce the burden of care for caregivers, especially family members. And uh, we can expect to reduce a lot of psychotropic medications that have side effects and they're very bad for people. And uh, there are a lot of randomized control trials to show the benefit. And uh, I recommend in the U.S., the United, uh, University of Texas and Baylor, Scott and White, they had randomized control trials. And the results showed that interaction with PARO improved anxiety, depression, pain, and stress significantly. And also 30% uh, of the medication for anxiety and some other uh, behavioral issues are decreased. And the PARO's effect continued two hours longer than the medications. And, uh, now, the Medicare, uh, the public uh, medical insurance uh, for elderly people in the U.S., they started to accept reimbursement. So, uh, for example, patients can be like dementia, cancer, PTSD, brain injury, Parkinson's disease, and so on. And if they are diagnosed as pain, anxiety, depression, and or behavioral issues, uh, PARO can be prescri prescribed for biofeedback therapy. And also, uh, PARO can be prescribed for rehabilitation, such as after stroke. And uh, uh, there are some CPT calls. And 
So Medicare and the private insurance, like Blue Cross Blue Shield, they accept reimbursement, uh, both in home health service and also in institutional medical service, like hospitals, skilled nursing, and uh, hospices. Uh, can I have sound? Uh, unfortunately, we can't hear sound. He's screaming. It's in Siena, Italy. So he has a... Oh. <laughs> ah, okay. Thank you. Oh, yes. So he has dementia, and, uh, Alzheimer's disease, and anxiety. He is always screaming in that manner. So first, when the therapist gave the, uh, gave the paro to the patient, the patient stopped screaming and started to talk to paro. So he expressed himself to the, uh, the therapist. Now he had smile. And at that time, the therapist wanted to calm him down in order to take him to lunch. So it was not the first time for the patient to interact with Paro. He knew Paro. And before lunch, before bathing, before dinner, when they need to calm him down, they use Paro. But before starting to use Paro, they gave psychotropic medication to calm him down. But after starting to use Paro, they stopped using medication. In the case of medications, it takes about 30 minutes to 45 minutes to have an effect. And uh, also, uh, because of side effects, there is a risk of falling because uh, the patient becomes sleepy and uh, may uh, fall down, uh, uh, fall down from the uh, wheelchair. And Can you touch? Okay, so uh, I, I was showing the uh, case of wandering. Interaction with power can improve the mood of the uh, people who have wandering and uh, reduce the anxiety or pain. Then they stop wandering, and uh, we can stop. Uh, we can use power for stopping wandering, and that uh, that also reduces the risk of falling. And a lot of people become uh, aphasia, that is a speech problem, after becoming dementia, like Alzheimer's disease, but the. Uh, it's very surprising, but a lot of people recover speech function when they interact with Paro. Some people didn't talk for several years or even more than 10 years, but they suddenly, when they interact with Paro, they start to talk to Paro. Then at that time, they can communicate with others. Uh, and a lot of people become Parkinson's disease, for example, and they have like shake, shaking or movement, but when they interact with Paro, they can keep very good uh, condition, and they don't have like uh, sh shaving their uh, head or movement. Unfortunately, I cannot show you the video. And also, Paro can be used for the rehabilitation. So, uh, so she has dementia, and she uh, couldn't eat by herself because of the weakness, weakness of the uh, muscle at the uh, throat. But so she had a tube from the nose to have the ingredient. But it, it, she liked Paro, and she started to talk to Paro, sang to Paro. Then uh, she ho started to hold Paro. And so she moved her muscle uh, at the throat and back. Uh, so she uh, started to eat jelly food. And uh, she didn't need the tube from the nose. And Paro can be used for the end of life of the people. 
So oh, she, is going, she was going to die while stroking Paro. And uh, that reduced the, her anxiety or pain. And uh, that Paro was specifically used for uh, having the end of life care. And uh, when, Paro, uh, when elderly people who need care, uh, especially who, ha who have dementia at home, uh, they improve their behavioral issues. And uh, that reduced the lot of burden of care for family members. And now in Australia, uh, they have a very nice system. Uh, it's called home care package. So when people uh, need care at home, uh, the government gives funds uh, depending on the level of need of care, from level one to level four. Level four is worst. And the people get uh, about 4,000 uh, Australian dollars per month. And uh, they can spend the fund for the, like day service or some purchasing the uh, eligible equipment. And now they accept Paro. So, uh, so Paro, Paro can be bought by using the fund. And uh, that will uh, improve their conditions at home. And uh, that will uh, for say, prolong their stay at home. So that will reduce a lot of social uh, cost. Because institutional care, uh, the institutional care costs much more than the uh, home care. So uh, I hope. <laughs> I, I, I may talk too much, but if you have more uh, information, if you want to have more information, please visit to the webpage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much for introducing Thank Paro. I think often when we hear AI, there's a lot of fear, but when we see Paro, who's so friendly, I think there's lots of fans of Paro in the room already. <laughs> So now, um, last but not least, we have Anthony Nunez, um, president of INF Robotics. Thank you. My name is Anthony. I'm the Chief Executive Officer at INF Robotics. We have developed Rudy and deployed Rudy to the older adult community. Rudy uh, is a result of over 10 years of work with older adults and advanced technology like this. Rudy is affordable, very easy to use, and allows older adults to remain independent and connected while addressing some of their primary concerns, one of them, of course, being their privacy. So the problem for older adults aging is not just a singular stream problem. You have the rising population of older adults, you have the diminishing population of caregivers, but you also have raising costs of care for those older adults. And so this is a very complex system when it comes to looking at the aging in place solution. Today, if an older adult desires to stay in their home, they require companion care here in the US. Companion care requires that you get a minimum of four hours at $100 minimum per day. That leaves over 20 hours every day each week of time when the older adult is not monitored. We do not know what's going on in the home of the older adult. We are unable right now to drive outcomes effectively because we do not know what's going on in the home of the older adult when no one is around. This is a huge problem in the US, but it's also one that we've looked at globally with our solution, being able to adapt it to the needs of not only other cultures, but other segments within the older population. And our solution, Rudy, is an AI solution that comprises of two components, the software component as well as the hardware component that I'm gonna show you in a moment. But the idea here is that we can provide companion care while providing the benefits of data analytics to help drive outcomes in the right direction for every older adult, and also optimize the care for each older adult. Every older adult ages differently. Every older adult's needs are different, and they evolve as they get older. With our solution, Rudy, we're able to keep those solutions in mind as we stay in the home of the older adult, and most importantly, provide that at a fraction of the cost of having a human in the home. So our product, Rudy, is a multi-patented solution that comprises of one, the care console where the caregiver is able to log in and communicate with the older adult, but also check on their status to see what has been going on during the day when no one was around. 
The platform on the right is the autonomous platform, Rudy, that operates with the older adult by communicating with them, and they communicate back with the platform. And what that platform does is it provides a unique form of engagement. What Rudy's really doing is understanding the older adult's personality and matching up with it. Rudy's really like their best friend. And by being their best friend, we're able to actually get that success on engagement five times higher than having a stationary solution in the home. And so conversations are really mood driven where we're able to boost the mood of the older adult, making sure that their mood stays in a positive state of mind. In addition to that engagement, we're also able to engage the older adult in exercises much more successfully than other means have tried. Now, we're also addressing the memory component of the older adult. I think this is a key issue because if you look at the cognitive impairment scale, what we're doing with Rudy is really addressing those needs and then measuring the outcomes through interactions of games, conversations, and movement, making sure not only that they do not fall, but that we can measure the outcomes of the games that we play with them that challenge their memory. And of course, connectivity, that's huge. Not only are we addressing loneliness, but we're also addressing social isolation through Rudy, and older adults are becoming much more engaged with the Rudy platform, not just the caregivers, but the family members and even their grandchildren in a very unique way, because there's really a gamification component here that grandchildren are really loving. Now, the benefits of having Rudy in the home that we've seen o over our deployments have been the fact that we are able to drive clinical decisions and financial decisions. We know exactly when is the best point within the older adult's care to elevate the level of care or to uh, alter it. We're also able to optimize treatments and really streamline the process by which a home care agency cares for older adults. Now one caregiver at a home care agency can manage up to eight clients remotely more effective. Now, as I mentioned, we have been, this culminates a lot of years of work that we've been working with older adults in their homes with this technology. And I think the most important part here is the fact that older adults are bonding to Rudy in less than two hours. We have older female clients that are referring to Rudy as their boyfriend. That's, that's the level of bond that we're establishing. And once we have that bond, they don't want to part ways with Rudy. And they're actually interacting more with Rudy on a daily basis. And what we're seeing on our engagement over 16 times a day on average, they're talking with Rudy, requesting something, whether that's a game, an activity, a conversation, they want to hear something uh, important that's going to boost their mood. They want to connect to their older uh, family members or older friends. All of that is very important, not only for the success of keeping the older adult in their home, but also for the utilization of such a platform. So in summary, I'd like to leave you with a few notes. One is the fact that this is something that really culminates the you know, years of work of deploying this into the homes of older adults. Uh, two is the fact that we're establishing an emotional bond with that older adult by really understanding their personality and then matching up to that personality as though a best friend would. And by doing that, we're able to really drive outcomes in the right direction in a much more effective means. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anthony. Um, Rudy also seems like a, a, lot of, a lot of fun, a very cool guy. And also interesting yes. that, that he has like a, a male uh, persona, because I think so often we think of AI, it often has a, lots been written about how it's often female, so that's mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm informed actually that, that this room is needed, I think even by the Security Council, so Ooh. they're really going to be tough on us and kick us out. But I think, <laughs> um, I mean, wanted to take a, a quick photo, but hopefully also some of our speakers um, can be outside the room and can answer questions. So I know we didn't have a chance to have an interactive discussion, but um, we'll be outside the room shortly and um, I'm sure many of our speakers would be very happy to answer your questions. So apologies that we can't take the questions right now um, because the Security Council is going to kick us out. Um, but uh, please do meet us outside the room uh, and I think many of the speakers can stay and, and answer questions. So um, please join me in thanking our wonderful uh, panel. And thank you very much for your attention and do meet us outside. Thank you. Yeah.